Arklatex Station, KSLA 12. For the people of the Arklatex, this is Arklatex News 12 Weekend with Christy Walton, Marnita Atkerson, and Tony Taglavor. Good evening and thank you for joining us on this Sunday night. I'm Christy Walton. You know, there hadn't been much good you could say about the Arklatex economy in the past few years, but a Louisiana Tech researcher is predicting a light at the end of the tunnel. He says we ought to be optimistic about the future economic development of Caddo and Bossier parishes. Pamela Jordan has more in this report. It's easy to blame oil for Louisiana's tough financial times, but oil, analysts say, isn't the only culprit. A nationwide downturn in construction and other basic industries hurt our economy too. That, coupled with oil's decline, left our area with 30% less business from 1981 to 1987. But last year, things not only bottomed out, basic industries picked up by 3%. But we still are only at 73% of what we were at before. That's the bad news, of course. The good news is that we have the opportunity to move forward now. And some industries in the area, like this local pharmaceutical company, are moving forward. Most of those companies are smaller businesses hiring hands full of people instead of thousands like GM and AT&T. The growth in smaller industries here is encouraging to some, despite AT&T's coming layoff. So while you see 300 people being laid off today in AT&T, during this quarter I would venture to say that we will replace those jobs. And Shreveport's people are committed to doing more than just replacing lost jobs. Arsenault says people here are spending millions of dollars on road and street repairs. Repairs that will make the city more attractive and more accessible to new industries. Industries that may eventually consider us for a new home. Pamela Jordan, Arquitex News 12. While oil prices have hovered in the $20 range here of late, U.S. Senator Lloyd Benson says the Texas economy is no longer hostage to boom or bust cycles of the oil industry. He cites studies done by two Southern Methodist University professors that say the Texas economy has been growing robustly in the last year and a half and is also moving into sync with national expansion. East Texas oilmen are mourning one of their own this weekend. Leon Gibson, longtime oil man and president of the East Texas Oil Producers Association, died early this morning. Funeral services for the 75-year-old oil man will be held Tuesday morning at St. Luke's United Methodist Church in Kilgore. The people inside a house in the 400 block of North Allen Street in Shreveport felt like they were in a war zone early this afternoon. A man came into the front yard and fired about eight times at the house with a 9 millimeter weapon. Then he crossed the street and fired several more times before walking away. Although police recovered a number of bullets and casings inside the house, none of the five or so people who were inside were hurt. Police have a pretty good idea of who their suspect is and they're trying to track him down. Bossier Parish Sher Sheriff's deputies still don't know what led up to a stabbing last night near Houghton. Witnesses say 55-year-old L.B. Kane was sitting inside a bar called Charity's Place when another man walked in with a knife. Deputies say the second man, Robert Taylor, walked up to Kane and cut him several times in the abdominal area. Kane was taken to Bossier Medical Center and later transferred to LSU Medical Center, where he remains in stable condition tonight. Taylor was later arrested as a house at a house on Jameson Road. He's charged with attempted second-degree murder and is being held on $20,000 bond. U.S. authorities say 21 Marines were killed when their helicopter crashed in an isolated mountain region of South Korea. Thirteen other Marines on board were also injured, some critically. The Marines were participating in joint U.S.-South Korean military maneuvers this weekend. The polls have closed in El Salvador, and it appears many voters didn't go to them because of violence that surrounded Election Day. At least five rebels, two soldiers, and three journalists died in exchanges of gunfire. We get more in this report from Donnie Lovler. Election day in El Salvador began with violence and death. Firefights between leftist guerrillas and government soldiers shattered the early morning silence in the capital. Army helicopters circled the city, at times firing rockets at suspected guerrilla positions. The dead include at least three journalists, who according to local press reports were killed by government soldiers. The Army has already accepted responsibility for one death. Meanwhile, balloting occurred under heavy military security. At some polling places, voters were frisked as they entered. Leftist presidential candidate Guillermo Ungo called the election day violence, 
part of his country's sad reality. It's a very contradictory situation. It's more openings for violence and more openings for peace or for talks and negotiations. So it's more repression, but at the same time more political spaces, more political openings. Roadblocks were set up outside the open-air voting stations where front-runner Alfredo Cristiani of the rightist Arena Party cast his ballot. Cristiani's supporters acted as if their candidate had already won the election. Showing up a few minutes later at the same voting place was Fidel Chavez Mena of the Christian Democratic Party. It's expected that Chavez Mena and Cristiani will have to face each other in a runoff election next month. Hundreds of international observers witnessed the Salvadoran exercise in democracy including a team from the United States. So I think it's important not to, uh, uh, to, to overstate the difficulties that voters are confronting in going out and exercising their, their right to determine the future of this country. A guerrilla transportation stoppage kept most public buses and taxis off the streets, despite rebel threats to disrupt the election. Most of the election day violence seemed to come from the army. Soldiers were everywhere. This is democracy at work in El Salvador. Yeah. Body search is to be able to vote under the barrel of a gun. Hardly an auspicious beginning for a new president, whoever it may be. An election campaign is on the minds of Soviets today as well. The Communist Party newspaper Pravda is reporting that Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev and others of the ruling Politburo have failed to win unanimous support as party deputies in a new national legislature. Meanwhile, thousands of Soviets took to the streets today in support of Boris Yeltsin. They're accusing the party of sabotaging Yeltsin's election campaign and threatened to wage a general strike if the reformer fails to win office. Yeltsin was sacked as Moscow's Communist Party chief more than a year ago after saying that Gorbachev's reforms were too slow and too timid. He's now running to represent Moscow in the new national parliament. The head of the Federal Drug Enforcement Administration says gun manufacturers should follow the example of Colt Industries and stop non-military sales of semi-automatic assault weapons. John Lawn made that comment today on CBS's Face the Nation. But on other programs, there were calls against government pressure on gun control by Attorney General Dick Thornburg and the new drug policy chief, William Bennett. A two-alarm fire in Jersey City, New Jersey this morning claimed the lives of a family of five. The victims ranged in age from 12 to 73. Investigators call the fire suspicious and suspect arson. That fire started in a vacant second-story apartment below that of the victims. Residents of that apartment had recently been evicted and two men reportedly seen leaving the building just before that fire. Still to come, we'll tell you about some folks left dangling at Disneyland. Up next. In Rome, Pope John Paul II marked the opening of Holy Week with an open-air Palm Sunday Mass in St. Peter's Square this morning. He led a procession of 60,000 worshippers to the altar on the steps of St. Peter's Basilica for a Mass commemorating Christ's entry into Jerusalem. In that Mass, the Pope noted that Sunday also marks the fourth annual World Day for Youth and called on young people to become pilgrims of the Christian faith. The President and Mrs. Bush observed Palm Sunday today in Washington. Bushes went to Landmark Episcopal Church near the White House. That church was founded back in 1815, and every president since John Madison has attended services there. Bush has received traditional palm fronds at the end of those services, as well as congratulations from the pastor on their new puppies. Some passengers on the Skyway at Disneyland that takes visitors from Tomorrowland to Fantasyland may well have thought they were on their way to Never Never Land. The ride broke down Saturday and 150 riders had to be individually removed via fire ladders from the bucket suspended 50 feet above the ground. Now that process took about five hours. It wasn't really a malfunction that caused the ride to shut down, but some mischievous guests Eyewitnesses have reported that uh, they observed guests swinging the buckets severely, which uh, triggered the safety system and shut the ride down. The Skyway remained out of commission today as crews worked to repair the ride. What do you do on a weekend when you want to show 30 French children a good time in America? You take them to see the great American pastime, of course, baseball. That's just what they did today here in Shreveport. Fairgrounds Field just happened to have a college tournament going on. 
And the kids out there got a chance to see everything from a home run to a bench-clearing argument. They seem to love baseball since they don't have baseball in France. That was one of the things that they specifically requested was to see a baseball game. We had a few phone calls about uh, discussions of what kind of clothing you needed to wear today and uh, had to translate that you didn't need to wear your church dress to play baseball, that you could put on your jeans and so on, but otherwise, no. French students will be in Shreveport until Friday. They've been pen pals with the fifth graders at Claiborne and local students hope to make their own trip to France to visit their new friends at their school. Not a too bad a day to be out at Fairgrounds Field. At least it didn't pour down on No, it didn't pour down today, but I tell you what, uh, tomorrow may be a different story. Oh, you had to say that. That's coming up next. Stay here. Well, not too bad a day. Then you're saying Monday is not going to be the day we want to get up and go back to work. No, it's not looking too promising at this point. We could see some locally heavy rain and maybe a few thunderstorms tomorrow afternoon. We'll take a look around the nation, first of all, and show you what's setting all of this up for tomorrow. Of course, we did have a cold front pass through here yesterday, and it has come back up into the Arkle, Texas, a warm front this evening. What we're watching at this point is the low pressure disturbance, which has been over southeastern Colorado all afternoon, dumping huge amounts of snowfall around there. Uh, Denver's expecting to see possibly 12 inches by noon tomorrow. And that system's going to continue to slide on to the east, setting up the stage for some showers and thunderstorms across the Arklatex region beginning sometime around midday tomorrow and uh, possibly some heavy thunderstorms by tomorrow afternoon. Now, the second thing that we're looking at is a cold front, which is just now entering the panhandle of Texas. This is going to provide us with some cooler temperatures, as we do only expect to get into the mid-50s for daytime highs on Tuesday. And quite a contrast for the folks in West Texas tomorrow. They got into the 80s this afternoon. They're looking for a winter storm watch there tomorrow afternoon, and possibly a little bit in the way of snowfall. Here's a look at the enhanced satellite view across southern sections of the U.S. this evening. We're continuing to see some shower activity over western sections of Tennessee and down into northern Mississippi. Also, a few rain showers uh, still in progress over central and southern sections of Arkansas. We are continuing to see some showers over western sections of Texas as well. Here's a closer look at the satellite view across the Arklatex, and as I was saying, we are still seeing a few showers in sections of Arkansas. Let's take a quick look at those on radar out of Shreveport, and we're showing you that we're continuing to see a few light rain showers down in south-central sections of Arkansas and a little bit of a light rain shower to the north of Monroe. This is sliding off to the northeast at about 30 miles an hour. Come back down to the satellite review and show you the temperatures within the past hour, and as you can see, as the further north we go, we're looking at some cooler temperatures, 42 within the hour in Little Rock, 54 in Monroe. A little bit warmer yet as we go back down to Alexandria at 62 degrees, 57 within the hour in Shreveport, 48 in Texarkana, and 61 degrees in Tyler. Right here at the weather station at the 10 o'clock hour, we are continuing to see a mostly cloudy sky with a temperature of 56 degrees, relative humidity at 69 percent, and our wind is out of the southeast at 7 miles an hour. Atmospheric pressure is dropping from 30.02. The overnight low temperature was 51 degrees, and we got up to a daytime high of 60 degrees. We're not going to see too much of a variance in temperatures overnight. We just expect to go down a couple of degrees for an overnight low temperature, around 54 to 55 degrees. Coastal sections of Louisiana and Texas will be coming in with the 60s. And as you can see behind that cold front, we'll be coming on down into the 30s for the panhandles of Texas and Oklahoma. Tomorrow afternoon, we do expect it to be a little bit warmer than what we saw this afternoon. The southerly winds in place and a lot of cloud cover out there. So we expect to be into the middle range of the 70s. And then tomorrow evening, uh, behind that cold front, of course, we'll be seeing some cooler temperatures. But into the Arklatex tomorrow night, of course, we'll come on down into the 40s. We will see that southerly wind in place and gusty tomorrow afternoon and possibly some locally heavy thunderstorms that low pressure cell and the cold front continues to slide on to the east. This is a very rapid moving system, however, as we're showing you here on Tuesday's map. This thing will get on out of the Arklatex in a hurry. We may see a few showers lingering during the early morning hours on Tuesday, but the next air mass behind that, of course, is a high pressure dome. This will come in and give us partly cloudy skies for the middle of the week and temperatures a little bit more seasonable. We'll take a look at the extended forecast now, Monday through Friday around the Arklatex. Looks like we'll get off to kind of a shaky start with a few showers tomorrow. The afternoon high about 75, though, and then cooling down to only about a 55 for Tuesday afternoon. And then the sun comes back into the picture a little bit to, to round out the week, and we'll come on up into the 60s. And one thing we want to bear in mind, tomorrow is...
the first day of spring. So don't forget that, even though we've got a little rain, it will be the first day of spring tomorrow. Well, and rain is spring-like. You know, we think of it as the sunny, pretty days, but the rain's also a sign of spring. Coming up, we have sports with Barry Hill. And the Lady Texters got their start in the NCAAs today, but they had to do it without one of their key players. We'll tell you who they were missing when we come back. I guess we've come to expect the Lady Texters to just win every game and win it That's big. That's right. Yeah, and on the court it was real easy for them, but off the court they had a few problems because the Lady Texters had to begin their drive back to the national championship without guard Sheila Etheridge, who was suspended before the game for breaking a team rule. Now, Tech coach Leon Barmore says the, su the suspension is indefinite, so there might be a chance for Sheila to return, but not, not tonight. She was out of the uniform as, as they played Oklahoma State, and they challenged the Cowgirls inside. They'll punch it into Venus Lacey. She'll spin, shoot, and score. Lacey led the Texters with 26. And still in the first half, Pam Wells gets the assist to Nora Lewis in the paint. And the Texters led 51-36 at the half. Second half action now. Number 40 for Oklahoma State is Liz Brown. She was heavily recruited by the Texters. You see why there. She finished with 26, but she probably wished she would have gone to Tech because she would have had Paulette Stahl and her team to help out. And Paulette can certainly shoot the rock from the top of the key. The Lady Texters win 103 to 78, and it was a surprisingly easy victory. We pretty much knew what they were going to do, and it was just a matter of us not letting them execute. And I think, you know, we played mentally a smarter game than we have in a long time. I think everybody was into it. Well, I don't think there's any question that uh, our scouting report showed us what we need to do, and, and we did. That is, we uh, defense their outside shooters and didn't give them a lot of open shots. They made some, but they had to earn them. I thought Nora Lewis' job on, on Jordan, she only had eight shots, made seven. Just think of that girl had shot 16 or 18 times. So I thought Nora's defense, I thought uh, us getting back and not letting him have a lot of easy shots was good. The Texters will next face LSU Thursday in Ruston. The Lady Tigers beat Purdue this afternoon. In the men's tournament, all five SEC teams were gone after the first round, and the Southwest Conference was in danger of losing both of its entries in the second round this afternoon when on record. Well, not all of today's basketball action happened on the court. Kentucky basketball coach Eddie Sutton resigned after four seasons with the Wildcats. Sutton had been plagued by rumors all season long amidst an NCAA investigation into the Kentucky program. Sutton says that his resignation is not an admission of guilt and that he's stepping down because of his love for Kentucky basketball. Well, just over a little, a little more than an hour ago, the Louisiana Tech Bulldogs returned from Nashville. The dogs arrived in Shreveport safe and sound, far away from the Oklahoma Sooners, who looked like they could have beaten a few NBA teams Saturday when they ended Tech's season in the Southeast region's second round. But overall, the dogs know they had a pretty good year. But, you know, we're not gonna let this one particular game down our whole season. I think our season was great. Uh, we finished 22 at 9, and, uh, you know, a lot of teams in the country can't say that. We played a good schedule. You know, we're conference tournament champs, uh, NCAA tournament bid, 23 wins, so we're not going to hang our heads about the Oklahoma loss at all. This afternoon at Fairgrounds Field, top-ranked and unbeaten Texas A&M ran into a buzzsaw from Stillwater, Oklahoma. We'll tell you about that when we come back. With two wins in the Dixie College Classic yesterday, Texas A&M stretched its unbeaten streak to 26 games. But this afternoon, the streak was in jeopardy against 11th-ranked Oklahoma State. And no score in the third when OSU's Brad Beanblossom turned on that pitch and sent it out of the park. That was a three-run shot, and the Cowboys would later add a solo homer to go up 4-0. But in the sixth, the Aggies have the double steal on, and OSU catcher Tony Kunis comes up throwing and throws into left. And here comes Kirk Thompson. He'll score easily. And then Chuck Noblick, will he beat the throw? Yes, indeed, and that made it 4-2, but now 5-3 in their last at bat. Base is loaded, two out, and Travis Williams lifts a lazy fly ball to center. That ends the game and ends the top-ranked Aggies win streak at 26. Oklahoma State now is 14-3 and should move up in the polls after their impressive showing in Shreveport. Over 5,000 passed through the turnstiles at Fairgrounds Field this weekend. That's a Dixie Classic record, and many of them stayed to watch the nightcap between Arkansas and the Ragin' Cajuns from southwest Louisiana which the Cajuns won. They came from behind to win by a score of 8-4. to four. Tom Kite fired a 71 today at the Players' Championship in Pont Verde, Florida. Kite finished 9-under and picked up a check for 243 grand. Chip Beck was one over for the day and finished one stroke back. 
and Hal Sutton had a great round this afternoon, but finished at one over for the tournament. And one final piece of video we want to show you, Christy, from the world of horse racing. You mm -hmm. won't ever see this. This is the start of the TZO Stakes. We're going to watch the TZO Stakes from Laurel Horse Track in Maryland. Now watch the horse on the outside, Desmond Donnie. After the gates open, he'll Where head is he going? Straight. He's going straight to the outside rail. Watch him throw the jockey oh, there, and no. then he gets his front legs caught over the rail. And he just He's keeps still on running. Chucking. He's still racing. This race isn't over for him, but uh, he didn't get hurt. This would have been this, you know, wouldn't be really very funny if he would have got hurt. But he did. If the jockey had been hurt, right. but that's pretty wild. He they finally got him settled down, got his legs back over, and uh, both jockey and horse are doing well. And, and hopefully, we'll never see that out at Fairgrounds Field. Maybe they won't put him in the outside lane <laughs> anymore. He needs to be in the middle this. where he can't get out. All right, come.